Hello again, everybody, and welcome to Off the Deaton Path. My name is Stan Deaton with the Georgia Historical Society, and we welcome you to our podcast for November 14th, 2017. We are recording today from the public room of the Alpha Inn, where we have been treated like kings. This week, we're going to talk about the time change. As you know, uh, last weekend, the first weekend in November, we all set our clocks back on Saturday night. Um, in my opinion, quite frankly, one of the great days of the year. You gain an extra hour of sleep that night, you go to bed, you wake up, and it's an hour earlier. Uh, and it's a great thing. Of course, we lose that in the spring, in March. And like you, I questioned, where did this idea come from, and why do we do it? Being me, however, as I began to look for the answers to these questions, it was kind of like going down a rat hole or pulling on a thread, whichever one you, you choose. But I began to ask questions like, where did the whole 24-hour day come from? Where did the idea of having seven days in a week? Why do we not have 10 days in a week and just have three weeks in a month? Um, where did all of these ideas come from? Who made the first clock? How long have clocks been around? How long have wristwatches been around? Um, the thing that measures time for almost all of us now, um, certainly in my generation and below, is our phone. I mean, this is a new phenomenon. We almost all used to wear wristwatches to tell time. Some people still do. My friend Brad loves his wristwatches. He has a great collection and is looking to expand it all the time. But the rest of us now pull out our iPhone. Um, I, I'm doing it right now. You look at your phone, it tells you what time it is. We've kind of stopped wearing watches, but that has not always been the case. We are now governed, too. I mean, we are under, under the dominion of the clock. That has not always been the case. So in this podcast, I want to take a look at time itself, how we measure it, how we came to this point where we are gaining, quote unquote, an hour uh, in of sleep in the fall and losing it in the spring. What's the whole point of that? The great historian Daniel Borston, who also happened to be a librarian of Congress, who wrote um, several books that you may be familiar with. He wrote a trilogy called The Americans, The Colonial Experience, The National Experience, The Democratic Experience. He wrote a book called The Discoverers. He wrote a book called, uh, and that was a series, The Discoverers, The Creators. I'm having to turn around and look because they're on my shelf right behind me. The Seekers, that, there's a trilogy there. The Creators, the Discoverers, the Seekers. But he explored this idea of time. He called time, quote, the most elusive and mysterious of the primitive dimensions of experience. And I think he's right. Um, what is time? Do we pass through time or does time pass through us? Uh, measuring it does not present difficulties. Defining what it is, philosophically or otherwise, can be difficult, but measuring it is not. As someone has said, it is the most accurately measured physical quantity. Now, time, of course, has to do with the movement of heavenly objects. It's st still all about the sun and the moon, as it was for primitive man. The seasons of the year are, of course, governed by the movements of the earth around the sun, but the smaller increments of time, like months, come from the lunar cycle of the calendar. And the Egyptians, doesn't it always begin with the Egyptians? The Egyptians, so far as we know, were the first to discover the length of the solar year and to define it in terms that were, use, that were useful for them. Uh, they did this by, by the, the discovery, if you want to call it that. They, I guess it had been seen for years. But Sirius, the dog star, the brightest star in the heavens, once a year... Sirius rose in the morning in direct line with the rising sun, and this became the beginning of the Egyptian year. And they noted that so much time went by before this happened, and um, 365 days, and for them, a quarter. So this was the first marking of, of the solar year, if you will. Okay, so that's how we get a year uh, of 365 days and some change, which we'll talk about. But what about the more artificial cluster of time that we call a week, seven days? Um, this is probably one of the earliest of the artificial time clusters. Again, you know, think about primitive man did not look at a calendar and go, oh, it's Tuesday, or I can't wait for Friday. Um, didn't happen. Uh, the week is not a Western invention, uh, nor has it everywhere been a cluster of seven days. Around the world, people have found at least 15, if not more, different ways in bunches of five to ten days of clustering their days together. 
Um, but the seven day week that we use now uh, has been ha, became pr- common in the Roman Empire, and that's really where we get it. And each day, they, they broke it up into a day dedicated to one of the seven planets um, that they knew about. Uh, these seven, according to their current astronomy, included the sun and the moon, but not the earth. The order in which the planets governed the days of the week were sun, moon, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn. Now, you may say, well, that sounds wonderful, but that doesn't sound like we do that anymore. But all contraire, we sure do. Um, you don't really see it in the survival of the English language, but if you look at something like Spanish, you will see it. And I give it to you here. Sunday, of course, the sun day. In Spanish, it's Domingo. Monday, the moon, Lunas. In Spanish, that's the day of the week from Monday. For Tuesday, Mars. In Spanish, Martes. Wednesday is Mercury. In uh, Again, you don't hear that in English, but in Spanish, Miércoles. There's Mercury. Thursday, Jupiter. Jueves. Friday, Venus. Viernes. Saturday, Saturn or Saturn's Day. Sabado. So, this is how we are still governed. Um, the days of our week are a living witness to the early powers of astrology. It is a holdover from the Roman Empire. Um, this is how they. This is how we came up with the seven-day week that we know. Again, it's more obvious in languages other than English. But these were the planets as they were known in Rome two thousand years ago. So this is how we, okay, so we've got a year, and now we've got, we've got days of the week. So we can begin clustering those days into seven-day periods, and then we cluster those into the months. And the Egyptians did this. Julius Caesar adopted the Egyptian calendar. So now we've got a yearly calendar that he, uh, again, had borrowed from the Egyptians and has basically ruled Western civilization since then. Uh it was not. The Julian calendar, the Egyptian calendar, was not a precise measure of the solar cycle. The actual solar year, that is the time required for the Earth to complete an orbit around the sun, is exactly 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 46 seconds. Now, um, the Egyptian year had been 365 and one quarter, so it's 11 minutes and 14 seconds less. And you think, well, that's not a big deal. It's not a big deal unless you go through time. Um, By the year 1582, this was a problem. Why? Well, because of Easter. Easter is set and was set by the Council of Nicaea. The first Council of Nicaea set Easter, or set the vernal equinox as March 21st. And Easter is the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the vernal equinox. They had set that as March 21st, but the accumulating inaccuracy, if you will, of the Julian calendar meant that by 1582... The vernal equinox was actually appearing or occurring on March 11th. So this is a big deal. So Pope Gregory the 13th determined that he was going to fix this. And, you know, we think we go to bed now in the fall and we lose or we gain an hour of sleep and then we lose it in the spring. Here's what Pope Gregory did in 1582. He said that you're going to go to bed on October 4th and you're going to wake up the next day and it's going to be October 15th. Well, he got those 11 days back. But that meant that next year, the vernal equinox would occur as the solar calendar of seasons required on March 21st. And so the leap years of the old Julian calendar were readjusted, if you will. Um, And to prevent the accumulation of another 11-minute-a-year discrepancy, um, the Gregorian calendar omitted the leap day from years ending in hundreds unless they were divisible by 400. So this produced the modern calendar that we live under, which is why if you want to find out if a year is a leap year, it has to be divisible by uh, 400. Now, again, remember, this was a reform implemented under a pope. So a Catholic, Protestant England and Protestant American colonies refused to go along. They're not going to do this. And they didn't change their calendar until 1752. They just wiped out 11 days in 1752. So George Washington, you know, had been born actually on February 11th. But the next year he celebrated his birthday on February 22nd. And that's how we celebrate it every year. So you can imagine there were people, even in 1582, before letters to the editor, before Facebook and social media, who did not like Pope Gregory taking it upon himself to simply wipe out 11 days 
again, it shows sort of the arbitrary nature of time, but there were people who said, hey, this guy has shortened my life here by papal decree. So this was very controversial, but it is the calendar that we still use to this day. And that's the key word there, day. So now we've got a year, we've got a calendar, we've got days of the week, we've got months, but what about the hour itself? How do we measure the parts of the day? Where did that idea come from? And I, I want to read you a, a, a short paragraph from Daniel Borston's book, The Discoverers, because I think he, he captures this moment very well. Quote, while man allowed his time to be parsed by the changing cycles of daylight, he remained a slave of the sun. To become the master of his time, to assimilate night into the day, to slice his life into neat, usable portions, he had to find a way to mark off precise small portions. Not only equal hours, but even minutes and seconds and parts of seconds. He would have to make a machine. It is surprising that machines to measure time were so long in coming. Not until the 14th century did Europeans devise mechanical timepieces. Until then, the measuring of time was left to the shadow clock, the water clock, the sand glass, and the miscellaneous candle clocks and scent clocks. While there was remarkable progress 5,000 years ago in measuring the year and useful week clusters of days were long in use, the subdivided day was another matter. Only in modern times do we begin to live by the hour, much less by the minute. And there again, I'm quoting Daniel Borston from his great book, The Discoverers, on how this happened. Clocks. Clocks are mechanical inventions. Um, so clocks were first invented to call uh, monks together for prayer. It was really something to be heard rather than seen, the way we think of it now. Um, and so the oldest surviving clocks are as you might expect, in cathedrals. The oldest surviving clock in England is that at Salisbury Cathedral, which dates from 1386. Uh, a clock erected at Rouen, France in 1389 is still there. The first domestic clocks were built uh, a little bit later uh, in the 14th century, late in the 14th century, but few of those have survived. Uh, as you know, clocks are intricate pieces of machinery, and so this is a, a, a craft of artisanship that took a great deal of work over time. Early clocks did not have minute hands. That wasn't really important to know that it was 520 or 345. Uh, what was important was to know what hour. Minute hands did not generally appear on clocks until the 1650s. So clocks, mechanical clocks, incorporate the dark hours as well. It's not just about the sun anymore. Uh, you incorporate the dark hours of the night into the day. And the nighttime would really become useful once artificial light was invented in the late 19th century. And of course now, uh, artificial light has completely revolutionized our world. But when does a day begin? That, that, is, that is not an easy question to answer. It has had many different answers through time um, in the same way that how many days there should be in a week. The Babylonians and the early Hindus calculated their day from sunrise. The Athenians, like the Jews began their day at sunset and carried on this practice through the 19th century. Orthodox Muslims, following their holy script, continue to begin their day at sunset. Um, mankind, of course, didn't, didn't really think of, of um, in, through history, didn't think of a day as a unit of 24 hours. Really, only when clocks are invented do we begin to subdivide the day into 24 equal time periods through the day. And in fact, now we use what is called a double 12 system. You know what that is. You look at any clock and you see it. There's 2 o'clock in the morning. There's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. But even with time standardized into hours, it still was important to know that time changed depending on where you were. 2 o'clock, let's say, in Boston, and the, and the longitude of Boston would not be 2 o'clock in the longitude of Savannah. So you had local solar time. So if you read historical accounts, for instance, of Paul Revere's ride, David Hackett Fisher, in his marvelous book, Paul Revere's Ride, actually has a part of his appendix devoted to how do you tell time in colonial America? How do they know what time it was? And all these accounts talk about it was 20 minutes past daybreak or that sort of thing. Um, but we're talking about mean solar time. What time is mean solar time in Savannah? Well, that's different. So... 
What we think of now as time zones did not come into play until the late 19th century, in the late 1800s. Um, our old friend, uh, Benjamin Franklin, had actually first talked about daylight savings time in an essay in 1784. But particularly it was railroad travel. Uh, and traveling across long distances in places like the United States and Canada where railway routes passed through places that differed by several hours in local time. As I said, where it was 2 o'clock in, in Boston, it you know, was different than 2 o'clock in Savannah. So there were several ideas for coming up for what we think of as standard time um, in time zones. Um, a fellow, a school teacher, principal of a school in Saratoga Springs, New York, was one of the first ones in 1869 to um, propose the use of time zones within which all localities would keep the same time. Uh, but it wasn't until 1883 when a Canadian civil engineer strongly advocated the idea. His name was Sir Sanford Fleming. Um, and in October of 1884, uh, Delegates from 27 countries met in Washington, D.C. and agreed on a system that is basically in use now. They adopted the meridian of Greenwich, the Royal Observatory Greenwich in England as the prime or zero meridian, and they adopted 24 standard time zones around the world. So this is how we had standard time in the United States. Now, this held sway until World War I. Uh, with massive manufacturing of munitions and whatnot needed, uh, daylight savings time was first trotted out during World War I. And oh, by the way, it was World War I that really led to the push for wristwatches. Wristwatches were originally part of ladies' jewelry. They were used almost as bracelets, uh, as you can imagine, on ladies' wrists. Men used pocket watches. But because of the necessary uh, the necessities of the military, during World War I, artillery strikes, for instance, had to be synchronized. It really became important for a way to keep time without having to reach into your pocket. This is where the wristwatch really becomes mass-produced, is during World War I, which was just 100 years ago. During World War I, daylight savings time was adopted in various countries. Clocks were advanced one hour to save fuel by reducing the need for artificial light in evening hours. So what is this whole idea of saving daylight, of, of, of somehow changing the ways? Well, let's look at it this way. On November 8th, sunrise here in Savannah under Eastern Standard Time was 6.48 a.m. Um, and, and sunset was at 5.28 p.m. Now that was after we moved the time backwards. On daylight savings time, that sunrise would have been at 7.48 in the morning and sunset at 6.28. Now the earliest the sun rises in Savannah on daylight savings time, is between June 5th and June 15th. It rises at 619 in the morning. If you get up at 619, it's, it's already daylight. Um, sunset during this same period is at 832. Now, had we not moved the time forward in March to daylight savings time, sunrise would have been at 519 in the morning, an hour earlier, right? And sunset would have been at 732. So by moving the clocks forward, daylight shifts to evening. There's more daylight in the evening. Hence, you are, quote, saving it, unquote, for later in the day when more people are awake instead of earlier in the morning when more people are still in bed. So, yes, you still have to use artificial light in the morning, but the idea is there aren't as many people up at 5 in the morning as there are, say, up at 8.30 or 7.30 in the evening. So you're saving daylight. Now, conversely, in the winter... Between January 7th and January 10th, the sun rises at 7.28 a.m. Now, had we not moved the time back for Eastern Standard Time in November, the sunrise would be at almost 8.30 in the morning. So we would be using all this artificial light and sunset between November 30th and De December 6th. As I mentioned, was at 5.19. Without the time change, it would be at 6.19. So the idea is to save daylight for long periods of time in the summer. Um, this was seen very dramatically. And by the way, when this was first done in World War I, farmers did not like it. They wanted more daylight in the early morning hours because they were up early going about their business and saving it to the evening did not help them. So this was not popular and it didn't last after World War I. During World War II, to help with war production, all clocks in the United States were kept permanently on daylight savings time, one hour ahead from February 9th, 1942, 
to September 30th, 1945. No changes in the summer. That's three years and seven months. Now, beginning in 1967, by an act of Congress, the United States has observed daylight savings time in the summer. Now, they've changed the way that they, they calculate it. But for the last 50 years, it has been the same. Now, as I said, it's moved around a little bit. In the, uh, originally, in 1967, it began on the last Sunday in April, and it ended on the last Sunday in October. Um, again, about six months in 1986, the U.S. Congress passed a law that, beginning in 1987, would move the start of daylight savings time to the first Sunday in April, but it kept the end date the same, the last Sunday in October. And finally, just 10 years ago, the latest change, you may remember this one, daylight savings time was changed again in the United States. The start date was moved up to the second Sunday in March, and it ended they moved it back to the first Sunday in November, a week later. So it was moved forward seven weeks in the spring and moved back for eight full weeks of daylight savings time, longer than it used to be. It lasts about eight and a half months now. So that, my friends, is the story of how we got time, the way that it is, the hours, the years, the months, the days, seven days in a week, and who they're named for, and why you had to set your clock back a week ago, and why you'll have to set it forward again in March. Yes, it's entirely arbitrary. Yes, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense sometimes, but man has been manipulating time, moving it around, chopping off days here or there to make up time in the calendar since literally the dawn of time, and I suspect it's not going to end anytime soon. So remember that when you have to set your clocks forward next March while you'll be losing an hour of sleep. We recorded today from the public room of the Alpha Inn, where our producer has been the Countess of Morcar. And as always, if you have any complaints about the show, up to and including the sound of my voice, or about the topic this week, time, who talks about that, then send those, please, to the Countess. Any good things you have to say about this show or about life in general, please send those comments to me directly at sdeaton at georgiahistory.com. Our mailman this week and every week, staggering in under the load of the mail we receive here, is one Gary F. Taylor, born and raised. That's right. Our legal counsel this week and every week is provided by the law offices of Gallipo and Taylor, where their motto is overstaffing and underperforming at reasonable prices. Our caterer this week is Hagee's House of Tacos, home of the drippy enchilada. All beverages provided this week by our friends at the Drost Brewery, where their motto is beer, because you don't win friends with salad. Our engineer this week and every week is the hardest working engineer in show business, Brendan Cannonball Krellen. You can find out everything going on at the Georgia Historical Society at georgiahistory.com. You can now find our podcast at Google Play if you have an Android and at the Apple iTunes Store and the podcast app if you have an iPhone. Tell your friends and family about it because after all, why should you be the only one who's miserable? And you can find my blog and other similarly painful podcasts at offthedeatonpath.georgiahistory.com. We'll see you again here next week. Thanks for being here. So long, everybody.